How's it going? How's everyone doing? Good? How's your day been? Good workshops? Learning a lot? Sort of? Yes? No? Maybe? Cool. All right. Well, we have a really, 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 really busy day um, or afternoon. Um, as you can see, the agenda uh, of everything that we'll be doing is up on the board. I think we're a couple minutes late. Um, but essentially, what I want to cover in this workshop with you is um, building this foundation for growth. So one of the things that I've noticed with, I think, a lot of startups is that they jump to, um, I guess, trying to solve kind of marketing uh, problems really quickly. They want all the answers. They want to you know, acquire users and drive revenue and do all these things. But before they can do that, and whether it's startups, you know, big or small, um, they really need to answer a set of fundamental questions about their business. Um, and essentially, the, all these questions are here. So everything from branding your startup to monopolizing a market niche to understanding your customers, activating a key message, and then finding uh, interesting opportunities to reach those customers. So in front of you, you have a few worksheets. Uh, the first one is called the Marketing Fundamentals Canvas. That's the one with the mission and vision on top, brand, audience, niche, and message. We're not going to be covering the top two today because we don't have time. That's going to be kind of your, your guiding framework for the entire day. And you can fill that out actually yourself because what we're going to be doing is we're going to be diving into each of the specific components and deconstructing them piece by piece. And once you do those worksheets at the end of the day and do all the heavy thinking, then what you can do is synthesize that information and then put it on that canvas. And then that canvas is something that essentially you can put on the board or put on a wall, um, and it will really help you think about your business more strategically. So this is part one of my two workshops, but both of them are four hours. How exciting, right? Lots to do. Um, the next workshop, which is tomorrow at the same time, uh, that one's all about building a growth process. So understanding different marketing channels, um, how to acquire customers, uh, how to prioritize different things, and how to create that growth playbook. Um, obviously, like if some people aren't going to be here today and come tomorrow, uh, they're going to miss out on some of these things because the ideas that you build here today will help you uh, in that process. Here's what I want to do. Um, this entire session will be hands-on. What I want you guys to work on or what I want you guys to do is start applying some of these ideas and some of these frameworks to your business. I want you to systematically break down your understanding of each of the different elements. Um, so then what I want you to do is uh, I want you guys to pair up with each other, uh, depending, I guess, on your interests. Um, if you have a company, then obviously you're going to be applying this to your own company. If you don't have a company or you're interested, um, then you should pair up with other people. Ideally, I think what I want to do is have two or three people together in groups. Um, what we'll do for each worksheet is spend a half an hour with you guys chatting and discussing it amongst yourselves, filling them out, uh, getting ideas, asking questions, etc. And then for the last 15 minutes, uh, I want people to share their findings with the entire group or the questions that they have that came out of the process. So it's going to be really fast. So for each one of these worksheets, think of it as 45 minutes, 30, and 15. Does that make sense? This exercise. Um, so why don't we spend, you know, 25, 30 minutes. Um, again, go step by step, talk about it, discuss it, uh, and then have your questions ready so that uh, for the last 15 minutes of this section, we can have a talk um, and we can really share some of the learnings that we got from this exercise. Any questions? So the question is, do I pick one idea for each person in the group, or do I work on all of them at once? I think however you guys want to do it, but I think probably the, the most valuable is to, is to just go step by step and spend a couple minutes on each one. Now, one thing that I found for, you know, as companies develop their brands, certain elements here will stand out more than others. Um, again, maybe it's the way that you communicate in the market, that's really interesting and different. Maybe it's the company culture. Maybe it's something else. So you might not have great things to necessarily put in every bucket. You're, I assuming, uh, young startups, right? You're, you're just kind of getting going or you're, you're entering the market. You're not mature. I think the goal of this is to start thinking about what your long-term brand is. OK, so the question is different. <laughs> Forget about everything I said. So, 
Okay, so if groups have different startups, I think probably what you want to do is work on your own and then have a discussion about how you approach the problem. I think for most people though, there's one startup and more people who are outside of that startup. So that shouldn't be a challenge. You should all be talking about the same thing. Yeah, I think it's, it's, is there something interesting in what you've built? You know, for example, uh, you know, take Spotify. Spotify is, you know, a phenomenal music service that delivers, uh, you know, music in a split second. And so that's really interesting and compelling. But what it, whatever it is that you've built, is there some interesting hook, some interesting technology, what have you, that relates back to the actual tangible thing? Cool? Question? Yeah, so words is more about language. How do you communicate your proposition? How do you talk to people? What tone do you take? How does it all sound? When I hear about your company, you know, do you use certain words like, for example, um, part of the Google brand is, is turning Google into a verb. And so that's, I think, what they did successfully from the perspective of words, you know, Google that. And that's, you know, that's pretty powerful because most companies don't have that. So actions is the things that you do, how you behave. Um, are you, you know, eco-conscious? Um, do you always do things a certain way? Things like that. Again, it's, it's fairly broad. It's, it's how you guys want to apply this to your own company. The, there's no right answer in this. It's you are the ones who have to define what you're about. The more that you can create a distinct identity, the more that you can create a common theme around all these points, the stronger that your perceptions in the market will be. And that's kind of, that's the end goal. That's what you want to build to, is if you're saying something different, but you're presenting yourself in a completely, you know, different way, and then your product is doing something else, that to me is kind of that lack of focus that I talked about. If you were able to um, really, I guess, identify the theme that starts running through each of these different components into that one sentence, like were you able to actually get there? Or do you have, you know, some good homework to do later on when thinking about how you want people to see your company. So let's start with that. Who's got questions or who has, who wants to share their experience and kind of where they arrived after doing this exercise? Um, I found myself uh, repeating myself in the first and the last, well, product truth and, and beliefs and values. Um, I know there's no wrong answer, but is that wise to keep repeating yourself? Or is that the point? The, the point of this exercise is to really start to uncover a consistency. And I think if you're finding similarities, um, that's a good thing because it means that the way that you present yourself, the way that you talk, the, the beliefs that you hold, all those things are coming together. And so when you present your company to the outside world, um, they will see you in the way that you want them to see you. If you had very different answers for very different sections, usually that's a sign of a lack of focus. Um, you're not presenting yourself in the, in the best way possible, um, and you're giving people mixed signals. And so I think, you know, it's a good thing. I think it's okay if there's overlap in each one, and it's okay if you didn't answer every single question perfectly. Well, what, again, what I want you guys to take away is I want you to start thinking about these things and, and laying the groundwork so that once you are big and, you know, successful, that your presentation is, is, is also, um, you know, very well done. We find it quite difficult because our, our product is for uh, B2B and it's, it, it provides tools for uh, events. And it's, it, one quite similar product is Eventbrite. Um, mm -hmm. And creating the, because we think about features, we, we, it's, it's kind of hard to come up with that brand. Awesome question. So just to repeat, um, there's difficulty in going through this process. So if you think about uh, creating a brand that will compete with Eventbrite, uh, what you have to do is you have to do something a little bit different than what they're doing. So if you go through this exercise and do it for them, what are their beliefs and values? How do they present themselves? How do they talk? What culture they've built? Um, what you should be doing is thinking about how are you doing that differently? How are you going to get people's attention when they have to decide between the two of you? Because Eventbrite is huge. They're already well established. Um, they are not the same. They are Great. So you're not the same. So I think the other thing that I think I shared with um, 
a lot of you is when you think about brand, only one aspect here is the product itself. And so what I want you guys to do is, is step away from comparing yourself against features. You know, our product has 128 megabytes versus this one has 256 and start to realize that people, especially in the B2B space, make decisions based on emotion. Um, and so while they may be you know, over-featured, what you might present yourself with is a product that's simpler because I've used Eventbrite and it's complete pain in the butt. Uh, it's really hard to find things and so that's a big issue and there's that, there's like frustration when you use the product. And your product might take the stance that you believe that you, know, you should be in and out in let's say three minutes when creating an event and managing an event. And that's not possible with Eventbrite. And so that becomes a core belief. The words that you use are you know, maybe like very like friendly and approachable and um, inviting because Eventbrite feels a little bit you know, dull and kind of corporate and soulless. Um, again, the culture that you build inside the company are you know, maybe people love you know, working with you or they're, everybody's from you know, the event space and outside of work that, you know, they love organizing things and that's, you know, that's the culture that you've built. All those little things together start to build this consistent theme that, sets, that starts to set you apart from your competitor that will help you in addition to the different features that you're building. Does that make sense? One more question? Questions? I have a question about uh, service companies who usually have bespoke solutions for their clients. So usually these kind of companies, they, they don't have really much of the emphasis on their branding, mm -hmm. but they have a really large pool of clients. So in order for them to, uh, to grow, um, do you suggest that they should um, put more emphasis on branding? Because they, their services are more bespoke, so that means that there's no much focus on their products and services. Okay. I'm trying to think of the best way to answer that question. So t tell me a little bit more about the business. So the, um, A business who delivers bespoke service means that for many clients, you have um, different solutions for them. And that, that kind of solutions are not necessarily uh, be focused on, for example, like if you are marketing, uh, general marketing agency uh, focusing on um, Google Ads and also focusing on logo designs. Mm -hmm. And that company only want to have those services, but mm -hmm. at the same time, they want to have a branding. Yeah. But people would see that these companies usually have bespoke solutions. They don't have much focus on their branding. Okay. So how, they do, how do they brand their companies, their solutions? Yeah. So I think you have to ask yourself is why, why do people choose one company over another. What is it that sells? Is it convenience? Is it price? Is it um, the working relationship? There is a difference between these companies. Maybe they don't do overt branding, but if you ask them to go through this exercise themselves, I guarantee you that they're going to have different answers or maybe they don't have good answers for anything. Uh, and so I guess what I'm suggesting is that branding isn't the answer to everything. Um, all the different exercises that we're going through will help you um, create a more consistent business. Uh, but what I think that all these elements here can help you do is, again, set you apart from your competitors. So think about how that decision process is made. Why do people buy the products? What do they like about the competitors? And try to juxtapose that against what you're doing and how you see the world differently. Does that help? A little bit? Still yeah. confused? Because uh, generally, uh, that's why I'm asking about usually companies who does bespoke uh, solutions. Uh -huh. Because bespoke, uh, yeah, custom software. Custom so, solutions so what's the difference too. between one company that does bespoke software and another? Yeah, because if, if a company does branding, they usually focus more on their specific products, specific uh, solutions. Mm -hmm. But I think as a whole, you can think about these bespoke, not all bespoke solutions are the same. Yeah. Is so it, how to brand a company that does bespoke uh, solutions so, to their clients? So that's the thing is I think when you're doing a bespoke solution yeah. and everybody's selling a bespoke solution, yeah. wh why is one client choosing one company over another? You have to ask yourself that question. And 
you have to kind of dig deeper because it might not be obvious, but if you dig deeper, you might realize that, uh, again, it's, the, you know, they care about the relationship and maybe a belief system of one of these companies is that they put the clients on a pedestal, they over-service them, they really take care of them, and they make them feel like, you know, things are simple, that, you know, whatever they need will get done. Whereas another company, again, might use a different type of language, uh, whereas another one might have a different type of culture. All these different kind of elements are not going to be different. And so even though they're all providing bespoke solutions, they're not doing the same thing. Like outwardly on a functional level, they're doing the same thing, but on an emotional level, which is the majority of this exercise, they're not. And so your challenge is to figure out which of those emotions um, you can target and how can you present yourself in a way that's, that's not the same. For an early stage startup, how f narrow or focused or wide should that one sentence be? I don't think it matters that much. Um, again, use this as, as a framework. Think about the bigger theme that's coming out of all of these uh, you know, different facets of branding. Um, most companies don't even think about this. They think branding is, is a logo. Um, and they don't realize that branding is a much bigger thing, which I hope I've kind of made a little bit more approachable um, and understandable by breaking it down into different pieces. So for you guys, you're not going to have the answers to what your brand is right away, but you will have little bits and pieces. And I think the challenge is, as you become a bigger company, you're not only focused on product features, you're thinking about you know, people and how they see you and you're using that to your advantage so that when they have a choice between A or B and you're A, then they go with you and they don't go with anyone else. So again, think about all these things, all like the exercises, you're not going to have the answers to them today, but my hope is that you'll really start to think about your business more critically and start to identify the, the gaps and the opportunities that you have to really enter the market with, you know, a strong presence. Cool? What did you guys think? Was this helpful? Not helpful? Out of this world? Maybe? <laughs> okay. The end objective, the ultimate objective for all this is to brand it, your company, to give a right image to the right audience, right? Yes. And for the appearance wise, is it a physical appearance, software appearance, or whatever image? So so appearance is, is visual appearance, the, the, the presentation itself, right? Because you have behaviors, you have actions, and then you have, you know, the visual piece. So everything from your colors, your fonts, your logos, your, you know, website, your marketing materials, even I think the employees are, are part of that. You know, do you have, you know, are people dressed casually or are they buttoned up? Whatever that is, it's, it's if people see you with their eyes, they're going to have a certain perception of who you are. And again, that contributes to this overall notion of branding. No, this is one sentence for your brand. How do you describe your brand? Cool. All right, cool. So one of the hardest challenges that I've seen among startups is defining who their product is for. Um, and it seems like it's simple, but if you talk to most companies, um, they can't really answer this question well. You know, who's your audience? You know, I don't know, men 18 to 34, or you know, busy professionals, or whatever it is. Um, that's not a very compelling description of the people that you're serving. Um, the other big problem that happens is that a lot of companies focus on too many audiences. We serve this person, and oh, we also serve this person and that person, and all of a sudden we're serving 50 different people. Um, no business has been successful doing that. When you think about, I think one of the best examples of this um, in terms of go-to-market strategy was Facebook. So um, first they started with Harvard students, then they, start, then they moved on to Ivy League universities, then they moved on to top-tier colleges, then they moved on to high schools, and then eventually they opened up to everybody. And what you see there is um, really a great deal of focus. Um, this social network, right, that they built could be applied to everybody, um, but they really chose to focus one specific group. They own that group, and then they moved on to the next. 
And so the purpose of this exercise is to help you guys think critically about who your audience is. You may not know in the beginning who that perfect audience is. And so you see you have you know, four columns here. You could add more. Um, but what I really want you to do is think about the key groups that will respond to your product, um, that will respond to the problem that you're trying to solve. And step by step, what I'd like you to do is actually describe who those people are. At the top, you have you know, the name of the person. Ideally, you want something, uh, you know, you can do that kind of at the end, but you want something like catchy, so that if you tell me who your audience is, you know, maybe they're, you know, uh, hardworking professionals or, you know, uh, how would I call them? Uh, casual, uh, you know, startup hipsters. Like something fun, right? When you tell me that in three words, I know right away who that person is and I can relate to them. Um, but you don't have to do that in the very beginning. You can kind of do that as you go through the exercise. Uh, the about section is um, essentially describing who they are a little bit in more detail. You can, you know, not right now unless you're a talented artist, but you should have a photo of who these people are so you can visualize it. You should describe a little bit what they are and you should provide examples of real people. You know, this is John or Mary or, you know, Susan or other non-Western names. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he's like, and well, Warren doesn't really count. Um, but anyway, start with that. And then essentially, you know, start kind of getting into, you know, slightly more specific on a general level. You know, what is the market size um, of this audience? Demos means demographics, so like age, income, um, etc. And general mindset. General mindset is how they see the, the world on a high level. So again, there's that kind of general section is forget about your product. Um, I want to know who these people are as individuals. Next section is the category. How do they see the category um, that you're in and what is their uh, category mindset? So for example, if you're in fashion, um, how do they see fashion? Uh, do they keep up with the latest trends? Um, are they like fast followers? Uh, do they have you know, a particular style? Like how do they see this general category that you're in. Then let's get a little bit more granular and let's talk about the product. So for whatever challenging, challenge you're solving, what replacement tools um, are they using to, to solve this? What features are really important to them and how often uh, do they use this product? Again, we're kind of zeroing in on the funnel, right? From high level to now we're talking about the product. Um, and then the, the last piece here is, is validation. So um, essentially what you want to do is as you develop these different groups, what, where I want you to get to is um, building, a hypo uh, building a hypothesis around who that ideal customer is. And you're not going to know that right away. But what you can then do as you come up with these hypotheses, and maybe this is something that you can do outside of this, is start to validate. You know, is this actually my ideal customer? When I present the product to them, are they excited? Um, do they, you know, instantly see the value proposition? Uh, and, you know, do I not have to actually put in a lot of effort to, to get them to use it? And again, you can do that through surveys, through conversations, through quantitative data, et cetera. And then ranking really is kind of at the very bottom, which is, you know, as you do this exercise, as you start to collect data about these people, um, Essentially, what you should get to uh, down the road, whether it's uh, a couple of weeks, which is probably a little bit less likely to, you know, maybe a couple of months, is who is that, you know, ideal customer that you can really, you know, put your product out to, and they're going to come on board, and then you're going to own that niche, and then you're going to move on to others. Okay, I'm going to give a suggestion because from participating in Lean Startup Machines and Startup Weekends in Malaysia and around Southeast Asia, in Brazil as well. Um, take a step back. I know you love your product, but this is time to think about the customer. Yep. So we tend to think, oh no, I have an idea. Forget your idea. Really take a step back to think on who are you solving a problem to, because I know we tend to be protective and try to force the idea down the throat of our customers. Not going to work. Take a step back. Just recommendation, because I've been through this kind of exercise and it's tough. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree with that. Um, Think about your friends. Think about the people you know. Uh, who are they, right? Just ask yourself that question in the broadest level. And you can't go too broadly. What 
um, I think Laís was saying is that, I see this too, is that most people focus on this, like how do they use products? If I'm a social media tool, what other tools are they using right now? Or if I'm tool X, then you know, how am I different? But they forget about you know, the category, but more specifically, they forget that people are people, right? It goes back to that um, notion I, I uh, presented in the keynote that's you know, users, who are users? You know, I, I hate that word because it doesn't really explain anything about the person. Um, it's not human, it's, it's assuming that people are machines. And so the best way to kind of break free from that is to not just think about how they use the product, but what they do outside of um, your product in general. Cool? Awesome, so again, we're not gonna have a lot of time. Um, maybe instead of doing many different ones, uh, pick the one that seems the most interesting to you, that seems like it would be the ideal customer. Uh, go through the process, kind of fill it out, think about it critically, and if you have time, maybe start on another. Sounds good? Cool. All right, let's do it. Uh, and we're going to wrap up at 6, so we're going to actually do uh, two more exercises. We won't do the last one, but we will cover the bases. So uh, the next one will be the market niche, and we're going to wrap up with uh, messaging, um, which essentially uh, is built from the three previous exercises. So you guys will start to see the, I guess, the compound effect of going through this entire process. Cool. Ready to go? Um, all right, so market niche. Do you guys want to bring up that worksheet? Essentially what this exercise is about um, is understanding the, the role of your company in the context of the overall market and the competition. Um, so in the first two exercises, in the branding exercise, we were talking about uh, developing a set of perceptions that would define your company uh, and help you stand out. We then moved on to your target audience, which is understanding the who of who is using the product. Uh, and the market niche is really about, as I said, the context of what you're doing because no company lives in a vacuum. Uh, and even though you know, a lot of people think that they have very original ideas and they're doing something that nobody else has done before, the fact of the matter is even though that is true, uh, people have a set of, um, a, uh, I guess, a set way of seeing the world and a set of anchors that um, govern their perceptions. So. Uh, if you're providing a certain solution, uh, most likely they, you know, see you in the context of other tools uh, that they're using or other competitors, similar to that concept of replacement products. So this exercise is really about helping you identify the white space of really separating yourself from the rest of the pack and making sure that the way that you present yourself is not only unique uh, and interesting on its own, but it's unique and interesting um, relative to other products. Uh, I think a really good example um, of understanding kind of the market niche is um, a lot, I guess, a lot of the different apps that came out in the photo space. Um, and a lot of them, you know, would say, you know, we're, we're really interesting and we're different and we have this feature or these filters or, you know, this sort of functionality. Um, and they thought that their competitive set was, you know, other like photo sharing apps. Um, when what they really forgot about is that their biggest competitor is Facebook, because the majority of activity that happens on Facebook, right, is uploading photos and sharing photos. Um, so in their case, they kind of got their market niche wrong, because if they had actually um, really spoken to their audience and understood their needs, they would have noticed that the majority of photo sharing occurs on that app. And so it's a very different strategy to say, hey, you know, we're building something that competes under you know, little app X and Y versus, hey, we're going up against Facebook. Um, and there's also probably this concept that you guys have heard, right, which is the, you know, build something that's 10x, 10x better than existing options. And so to help you define that proposition in a clear way, um, that's going to be the goal of this exercise. So if you kind of look over here, you know, you don't necessarily have to come up with three different market niches, though if you're exploring different ones, then it's worthwhile to put them out and to think about them. Um, but that's really the name. So to find the market niche. White space is essentially you're saying, well, what is that opportunity in the market? What, 
um, what is not happening today or, or what, you know, what can you do or, or what's not um, available at the moment um, in a particular industry. So what is that industry? Is it photo sharing? Is it social networking? Is it, you know, real estate? Is it a subset of that? So define that. Then the points of difference is what specifically are you doing that's unique and different? And I want you guys to think about both uh, the functional benefits, the features of the product, um, but also some of the emotional benefits. This next piece is uh, what I'm calling monopoly potential. So uh, borrowing from this concept of, of Peter Thiel um, in his book, Zero to One, um, he really talks about successful startups being able to monopolize uh, a certain niche to essentially eliminate a competition because their value proposition is so much different than everybody else that they're in a category of their own. So what I want you guys to think about as you define what your niche is, is really challenge yourself and say, do I really have an opportunity to own this specific space? Could I conceivably, if I executed um, on this product really well, if I had a great go-to-market strategy, could I create a, a monopoly out of it or not? So this is kind of like the bullshit test. And then the last piece is framework. So um, in a lot of, I guess, your pitches and a lot of times as you present the product, um, you use different types of frameworks to actually illustrate that, to help people understand where you fit into the big picture. Um, so one of the things that I've done uh, on my blog, which by the way has a lot of information about um, some of the other concepts that we've discussed, uh, is four different ways to kind of think about uh, what a niche could be, which you don't see. But we'll fix that. Give me one second. I could probably fix it a different way. So one of them is a two by two matrix, which is essentially you're choosing two different factors. These, you know, there, there's no right answer for this, but two different themes, you know, maybe it's, you know, price and reliability, let's say, of your product. And what you're saying is that everyone else is, you know, overpriced and not very reliable, and then my company is here. So I basically cracked that. Maybe, you know, people consider different things um, when they make their decisions, but you're proactively saying that we're going to be the best on those. And that's how you, you essentially, you know, are able to uh, define a niche that stands out from your competition. Uh, another one is a Venn diagram. Again, simple concept. You're saying that your product is a combination of different things that, you know, maybe there are photo sharing apps and other social networking apps and, and some other thing. You're a combination of all of them. And the way to visually represent that is through a few different circles where you fall into the center. Um, another one that's fairly common that I've noticed is a flow chart. So especially like in B2B businesses, um, you know, people have to take several different steps to achieve an objective. Um, let's say we're talking about travel. The different stages of the travel process would be um, inspiration, um, which is where my company played in, you know, the very beginning of the process where you're thinking about, you know, where do I go? Um, where, you know, what are some of the interesting places that I could potentially go to? The second step is actually research and planning. So um, looking into information about those different destinations um, and starting to make decisions about what you like and what you don't like and what fits your schedule. The next step would be booking, right? You're actually purchasing the tickets to go somewhere. Um, then the next step after that would be travel. Uh, and then there's a step even beyond that, which is when you come back from the trip and you reflect on the journey. So that would be kind of like a flow chart. Um, and essentially, uh, if you play at different steps of the process, you could say that I want to do you know, one really well, and that's what I'm going to own. And presenting it this way it becomes very clear that you know, the way we used to present our product is um, we're you know, the very beginning of the travel discovery process, this idea of inspiration. And then the last one, which is a little bit um, less common, but uh, I figured I'd share anyway, is, is this notion of like the wheel and spoke model. Often this kind of applies to like aggregators, like you know, the kayaks of the world or you know, daily deal sites or whatever it is that actually bring in information from many different sources and create something unique and different. 
And again, these are just four simple models that, you know, as I've kind of looked at different companies and spoken to different founders, I found that, you know, this is kind of like a helpful way for you to illustrate where you fit into the big picture. Because if you're going to pitch VCs and you want to get them excited, you have to really present your product uh, in a very compelling way. So, all right, let's actually fix this. Awesome. So I think this is it, right? It's just as with all the different exercises, you have different kind of pieces. I want you guys to kind of go through each of them systematically. I want you to test your thinking. Um, and I want you to be confident that the way that you present your market niche is actually compelling. It's believable. Um, and if it's not, think about why uh, it's not working. Any questions? Yeah. So white space is really like the opportunity. So if, you know, competitor X and Y and Z are doing this, what aren't they doing? So, yeah, what are they missing that you're doing really, really well? Right, if you kind of look at like the two by two mm -hmm. matrix, right, you guys saw like a bunch of dots, right? All the dots were kind of in the bottom left. The white space in the, is in the bottom right. The white space is defined as, you know, feet, um, you know, benefit one and benefit two on the X and Y axis. So it's kind of like a, a visual way to kind of, you know, represent like this is an opportunity. It's something that nobody else is doing. Okay, so question is how small is small for a market niche? And I think this goes back to this bigger idea, right, of you guys are small, right? You only have a couple of employees, you're just starting out. You're, <laughs> as the expression goes, you're not gonna be successful by trying to boil the ocean, um, right? You can't be everything to everybody. Uh, you can't, you know, just decide that I'm gonna appeal to, you know, five different customer groups and I'm gonna go after, you know, this entire market. So usually when you think of, um, you know, industries, let's say, you know, I've been using like the example of like social networking. Um, social networking is fairly broad. Um, if you position yourself as, you know, somebody who plays in that space, that's probably not very compelling. But maybe, you know, if you say something around, you know, video sharing or, um, like disappearing messages or things of that nature, that's a little bit more specific. So I don't think a niche, uh, you know, niches can be small, but usually the problem is that they're too big. Uh, and I think the way to actually test what, you know, small is, is, is try to do a market size. What, you know, what is the number of people who, you know, use social networking products versus, um, you know, video products versus something else? Uh, and, you know, obviously you probably want it somewhere in the, tens of thousands or something like that, right? You, you wanna be able to build to something and then you wanna be able to expand outward uh, later on. So, uh, you know, you, you can't kinda go after just a tiny piece of the internet. At the same time, it can't be, you know, so big and overwhelming that you don't know actually how to bring your product to market. Does that help? Cool. Any other questions? Are you guys alive? Do you need Red Bull? Stand up, do some jumping jacks. Do you want to jump right into it? Keep it quick. We've got one hour left. We're almost there. Finish line. And one more exercise after this, which is the key message. Hmm? Yep. We could do, yeah, 15, 20 minutes. Is that good? Let's do it. One more question. So you mentioned about the niche you wanted to be in the initial stages, tens of thousands, but there's an opportunity to grow in size and then vertically in other aspects as well. But from an investor's perspective, if your niche is too small, is this like an issue or do you want to, you know, start pitching a bigger market size? Yes. Yeah, so I think it's important to distinguish what you pitch to investors and what you look at from the marketing perspective. From the marketing perspective, it's always going to be the, the much smaller 
uh, niche because that will define your go-to-market strategy. You start small and you expand. And usually uh, what you do is you target one small niche, but then there are related niches around it. And then there's the broader market. And for investors, you're always going to be pitching the, the big market. Um, again, for the most part, <laughs> a lot of them already know that it's, it's kind of BS in some regards, right? Like, you know, billion dollar opportunity, you know, what does that mean? Um, obviously, you want to kind of, you know, going back to your mission and vision, you want to shoot for the stars. But the way that you prevent that from being just, you know, a made up number is that you have a really strong plan of how you will grow sequentially, right? Like back to that Facebook example of, you know, this type of university to, you know, a broader group, et cetera. So I think, you know, if anything, go a little bit smaller than bigger because most people go bigger and then they start to lose focus and, um, you know, their product doesn't take off. Cool. Let's jump to it. Um, people always like to relate to things that they already know and things that they're familiar with. Anytime you're introducing a new concept and a new idea, um, even though you think that, you know, you're doing something, you know, completely amazing on its own, um, and a great example is, you know, whoever, uh, you know, invented the car, Henry Ford kind of, you know, doing this new thing, you know, back in the day, people thought that, you know, it was like a better horse or like a better train or something like that, right? And it sounds kind of funny, but it makes a lot of sense. If you don't know, um, if you don't understand something and it's new to you and you've never experienced it, then the only way that you can understand that as a human being is to reference something that you already know. And so I think for any of you who are really introducing something that um, you know, people haven't used yet or don't know about, uh, your challenge is gonna be a little bit different. You're uh, less talking about yourself in the context of competitors, but you're more relating yourself to similar products that sort of achieve what you do to help people understand what it is exactly that you do. And then you have to spend time educating them and teaching them about it. That's kind of you know, the, the true like first mover uh, perspective. Uh, yeah, so I think that's it. You know, I think that's, that's just you know, an interesting kind of thing to, to, to think about is, is people always will relate back to what they know. So who wants to share, um, I guess, some of their insights um, in this process, things that they discovered, or maybe um, you, you simply have uh, some, some more questions or need clarification as you went through the process. When I was going through the worksheet, I came across the, the mo monopoly potential. I didn't quite understand that part. Great question. So what is the monopoly potential? Um, I think one thing I could have done better in this exercise is put that on the very bottom. Uh, the monopoly potential is uh, the realistic expectation that this niche that you've defined is something that you can dominate and be very successful in. Um, so one of the examples, one of the startups that um, has a fast food startup that serves noodles um, and is a healthy option. Um, you could look at three different niches, for example. You could look at um, fast food in general, the McDonald's and the Burger Kings and the KFCs and those types of restaurants, right? And you're positioning yourself against them and you're saying, you know, we're going to beat them out. Chances are that the monopoly potential there is, is very low. Then you move to the next category, which could be, you know, my competitors are noodle restaurants. Um, and maybe, you know, there are quite a few of these restaurants around so that the monopoly potential is, is, you know, okay, it's not that great, but it's not too bad either. The market's not saturated. And then maybe the third example is you're positioning yourself against healthy food options. So that's some of the noodle restaurants, but then maybe, you know, it's hamburgers um, and salads or something like that. Uh, and that market is, is not that well served, and so your monopoly potential there is, you know, could be quite large. So again, as you kind of go through the exercise, uh, the whole point is you do a lot of the research and the thinking. You know, you identify the white space, the, the industry slash competitors, your point of difference. You kind of visualize in a nice way how that might look. After you've kind of done the process, then you kind of take a step back and say, you know, does this make sense that I could really own this market? You know, am I bullshitting myself or, you know, could I actually do it? Because if it's not believable to you, then, 
you know, won't be uh, believable to investors either. So it's almost like a check of, of whether or not it could work. In the same way that, you know, in some of the other exercises, like when you think about your customer it's, it's, and you kind of dissect them, then you start ranking them of what is the potential for them to be your ideal customer uh, and be the one that you really want to go after. Cool. More questions or thoughts? Was this helpful? Were there any, any discoveries that you guys made about your business or different ways to kind of think about how you present it? A little bit, yes or no? Cool. All right. Again, kind of keep thinking about it um, and keep pushing yourself to you know, present your company in the best way possible. Or if you find that you're having a difficult time doing it, then maybe again, go back to the product and the feature set. Are you um, really proposing something that's unique and different in the market? Uh, or are you too similar to the offerings that already exist? Okay. Yes. Uh, am I looking on the white space in the, uh, my own industry and, uh, or should I cross over to other industry okay, to look at the white space? I mean, I'm not sure. Okay? Because sometimes the industry is already saturated. Okay? So would it be an option that I, I cross over to other industry to take a look? Yeah, so I think that's a good question, which is, you know, do I cross over to another industry? And I think the question is really, I think what you're asking is, um, what is what is my niche specifically? Is it, you know, this industry of what's the industry? So employee training, right? Is that the industry, or is it? Um, how would I put it? Maybe like uh, human development, right? And maybe those those sound like similar things, but they're different. Maybe the companies have different budgets set aside for each one. And if you position yourself as a training product, then money comes out of a sp specific place. You have to sell to specific people. That's already very developed. But there's another budget that's set aside for things that are similar to training, but they're called something differently. And so you start to define your niche that way. You start to present your product in that context. And even though you're essentially providing the same services, you're positioning yourself in a different way. And so your niche is different, and your opportunity to su succeed is different. Um, oftentimes when a niche is very saturated and there's a lot of competition, right, then how can you be a monopoly when there are many different competitors? Again, it goes back to uh, presenting yourself in a different way, using different language or a different audience or changing up the product. It's one of those things. But if you're running up into too many challenges, that probably means that one of those elements is wrong um, or, you know, isn't correctly positioned to the customer. All right, guys, one more. Are you up for it? So key message, this is a really interesting one, and there's a specific reason why this is at the very end, because if you look at the, the marketing fundamentals canvas that summarizes all of these concepts, the key message is on the bottom. And the reason is um, that you can't develop a compelling way to communicate to people if you haven't figured out what you're about, which is the branding piece, who your audience is, uh, and how you fit into the competitive landscape. Once you've figured out all those different components, and again, that will kind of take time, you've basically set a constant. I've got one unified brand, I have one customer, and I'm playing in one niche. That gives you a lot of clarity. At that point, what you can then do is then you can start testing ways to communicate with people in a compelling way. And I think the best way to think about messaging again, is in this simple tool, um, where you first think about the themes um, that are derived from the product and what you do. Again, themes could be you know, anything from, like let's talk about uh, travel, uh, and I guess my startup. You know, it was everything from inspiration to great design to um, you know, trying new things to getting away. Right? Those are four different ways to talk about what the product does. The product's the same, but I'm changing the messaging. 
So let's say that those are the themes. And you can start to brainstorm again, whether it's different features that you want to highlight or different benefits. Whatever that is, it's a different kind of concept. And some of them overlap, but the idea is that you have a range of different ways to talk about the product. You should first focus on the theme, right? The broader idea behind what you want to convey. And you don't have to get that perfect. But once you have a theme, what you can then start doing is articulating what that theme is. Um, the way I like to usually do it is just in one sentence. Uh, explain what benefit you're providing to people. So it's not explain what the product does. It's not explain what features you have. It's how does it solve a specific problem to a specific person. Thinking about different ways to do that. And one of the things I found that when people develop messaging is, you know, they describe what the product does, which is, which is not right. So it's not benefits driven. Um, another thing that commonly happens is people start to use ands. My product does this and that and also this. That never works. If you can't say everything in one sentence, in one clause, then your message isn't compelling. Right? Because by the time you get to the second part of the sentence, I've already forgotten what you're saying, and you've lost me, and my eyes are glazing over. The third thing that people do is they overcomplicate things, and they get really worried about how exactly I'm saying this message. And I think what you guys should keep in mind is to, is to keep things simple. Um, don't overcomplicate it. Don't sweat the little details. Um, as long as you're systematically writing out different ways to talk about your product, and you have a running, um, I guess, history of everything you wrote, that will help you refine a more compelling way to say what you want to say. And that's really where the third column comes in, is once you write this statement, and don't be too critical on yourselves, talk about the pros and cons of that statement. What do you like about it? What don't you like about it? And as you do this exercise, you start to find, all right, well, this doesn't work. The way that I'm explaining the product doesn't, you know, doesn't quite resonate with the audience. Why? Well, it's because people don't understand this aspect of it. So you step back and say, well, how could I change that? And you write a different statement. And then you write a different statement. And you kind of test that. And you gather feedback. And eventually, you know, in the same way that a lot of you have probably experienced pitching to investors, you find that formula. For, for what works and what doesn't. Um, and really, you know, what, what the key message is, is, is the baseline for how you talk about your company on a bigger level. If you have a really compelling key message, then you can build out your website, you can build out your marketing collateral, you can almost create this architecture uh, behind how you talk about the product. So I guess to give you a concrete example, the, the key message for, um, Wanderfly, my travel site, was uh, Wanderfly inspires people to, to travel more. Um, and so the idea there is that we create this tool that um, is so emotional and so inspirational and so visual that by using it, people actually want to get away more because the process of doing that is interesting and it's exciting. And again, when you take it, you know, that whole idea of, of inspiration and motivating people to travel, you can build out a lot of language around that um, whenever you're creating different types of marketing collateral. So again, think of the message, think of kind of the output of this exercise as, as almost a platform. Um, it's specific enough that uh, you know, it doesn't feel very vague. It's not, you know, we're trying to do you know, all these like, great things, but at the same time, it's not so focused that, or narrow that you can't actually tell a story around it or um, you know, build out different types of uh, marketing collateral. So again, I think the best thing for you guys is to think about different facets of the product, different things that you do, uh, different aspects of the company, different value propositions in a sense. That's the theme. Write out a very short, snappy sentence that describes what it is. And then think about what makes this sentence good and what doesn't make it good. Um, and then essentially go through the process multiple times and then get feedback. You know, say it out loud, talk to people, uh, and get their perspective on why it's working and why it isn't. Um, one interesting as well to kind of keep in mind is that 
good kind of feedback is telling you why something doesn't work. If somebody tells you I don't like it, it's not really helpful and it's not gonna, it's not gonna motivate you or inspire you to, to make the messaging better. But if you start to kind of dig a little bit deeper and ask, you know, what exactly about it don't you like? Well, I don't like this because it doesn't convey this. That'll give you more ideas as to how to really develop something that, that people, um, I guess, uh, are attracted to. Any questions? Was that clear? Oh, question. Okay, a little lost on the theme. Um, so tell me about your product. Um, my product is uh, group collaboration uh, meal apps. So group collaboration meal apps. Okay. So people will uh, organize a group lunch, for example, uh, by using our apps. Okay. So it will help you to make a decision on where to eat. Okay, did everybody hear that? Group collaboration app. So here's the theme. Um, for example, is, so is the value proposition here something around uh, ease of use? Like ease of use, for example, could be like one common theme that planning, uh, you know, any sort of group outing is a pain in the butt. Uh, you have to organize people, you have to get their emails and it just doesn't work. So maybe in the messaging, the, the best way to explain that value proposition is to talk about how simple and easy it is to do something. Um, another theme could be the social aspect of the product. So when you bring different groups of people together, there's an interesting dynamic. Uh, there's something unique there. People are coming together, sharing ideas, sharing food, whatever it is. And so maybe in the messaging, the most important thing potentially could be the fact that this app offers this unique experience that can only be had when a few people are in the room. Uh, and I probably don't have any other good examples aside from that, but you can start to see, right? It's still the same product, but it does, it satisfies multiple benefits. Uh, and there are probably a range of those different benefits, and it might not be obvious right away which one of them is more compelling than another. You might think that it's simplicity, but people actually respond to you know, the social aspect more. So that would be an example, I guess, of, of different themes. And based on those themes, you can then start writing out statements. Well, how would I articulate uh, simplicity? So uh, my app, you know, makes it, you know, super simple and easy to get together with people or, you know, it's, you know, we do it, you know, with a snap of the fingers, right? Like, you're starting to explain that theme in a statement that people can relate to. And you could probably do that you know, several different times. You can say the same thing several different times around one theme, and then for the next theme you can do the same. So it kind of becomes this iterative process of what is, you know, essentially you're trying to find what is, what is the, the idea behind what I do, and what is the right set of words to explain that idea. Did that help? Hi. How can you differentiate theme and message? So the theme is just the big concept, right? Think about the different benefits that your product provides is, and, and just write them out. The message is the way to articulate that bigger concept. So you can say if the theme is X, you can say that four or five or six different ways. That becomes the point where you start to explore how to do it. The theme is just, you know, the bigger idea. Yeah, th think of, I guess, theme as, you know, a larger benefit. And, and just, you know, describe it in a, in a word or two. Simplicity, inspiration, discovery, um, ease of use. I think those sorts of like bigger concepts. Um, but those are fairly vague, right? They're directional. And in the message, you're explaining them a little bit more so that people understand them easier. Um, I have two questions. First of all, for the message, you try to 
from my understanding, the message in this context is some catchy work, words that. And second question is how we go to pro and cons, how we can drill down, because for a catchy words, in regards how we drill down, is very depending on the niche mark customer that we are target to. So in one stage, it's already there. It's, it's, so you, you can share. <laughs> All right, so two questions there is, um, is, is the message a uh, catchphrase, a tagline, uh, et cetera? The, the answer is no. Um, a lot of people think that the message is that. A lot of people put taglines and logos. Taglines are basically awkward ways of saying what you really want to say, but you can't find the right way to say it, and so you use this crutch. You use this you know, catchphrase, and the catchphrase is usually cheesy. It's, it's not interesting. It, it confuses some people, and it degrades what you have to say. And in general, that whole class of words, you know, the taglines, like they become the creative expressions of the message. The message is this benefits-driven statement that's very simple um, and ex explanatory and inspirational. Um, think of that as, you know, the message is, some, is something that you use to, you know, let's say brief the copywriter. If you have somebody who's, you know, a very good writer, um, you give them this strategic concept and you say, you know, take this and write all of these creative words on it. Write some great website copy, but keep within the message that I want to convey to the audience. I'm sorry? Yeah, I don't, I typically don't craft the, the key message as, as the what. Um, I, I like to phrase it as a benefit. So why don't we do this? Uh, this will, I think, help you. Uh, Does it help if the message comes with like an e visual trigger, like? When I say this sentence, you can imagine how it's like the benefit. It's like, can you give me an example? Uh, uh, imagine, uh, imagine uh, getting a cap to your doorstep. You know, with just three simple clicks. You know, th things like that. Okay, got it. So, like uh, again, I think um, the question here is like, I think you're speaking about the creative side of things, right? It's it's. Uh, the message is very strategic. It's a bit like a platform. It explains the benefit. And then once you understand what that is and what you know, people get excited about, then you can you know, think of very like, creative ways to say that. So do you guys know Duolingo, the language learning app? So if you just look up on the screen, so I did a couple examples for different companies. And think of the focus as really the theme here. So, you know, Duolingo has this product that helps you learn a new language. How do you express that in a message? So you could do it in different ways. I don't know what the answer is, uh, but the, these are three ways to do it. So one of them is Duolingo makes learning language accessible to all. So the benefit here is that language learning, which is typically paid um, and it's run by old school companies uh, that charge you for the ability to learn, now all of a sudden we're making it accessible. So the focus is, you know, this bigger cause of accessibility to everybody. Another one, it's a fun social way to immerse yourself in a new culture. So the focus here is on the community element. Because when you learn a language, you're getting to know a new culture and a new set of people uh, and values that you can relate to. Uh, another one is Duolingo unlocks your potential as you master a new language. So this is about you becoming a better person, uh, learning a new skill set, uh, and potentially improving in your job. So again, as you guys can see, right, same company does the same thing, but we're talking about it in a different way. Airbnb, um, I think, is another good one that most people can relate to. So Airbnb lets you live like the locals. Like here we're talking about this very unique experience that's much different than staying in a hotel. You're staying in somebody's home. They're, you're, you're kind of almost entering into their life, uh, and you're getting to see a new city from their perspective. Another one is opens the doors to homes around the world. So this is access, right? Previously, um, when you were traveling, this, this wasn't possible, actually living with somebody else. Now they're, you know, you're in their home and you're part of their lives. And that's pretty cool. 
right? Because you get to see how people live. Just like when you watch shows on TV of people buying apartments in different parts of the world, right? It's pretty cool. So that's one aspect of it. And then the last one is inspires a richer travel experience. So thinking about um, traveling, right? I'm here in Malaysia, I'm here for a few days. I wanna get to know the culture and the people and I wanna try the restaurants and do all these things. There's not a lot of time. If I stay in a hotel, in many ways I'm removed from the experience. Um, of being here because it's, it's a bit artificial. Whereas if I stay in somebody's home, I can do that much more and I can get to know the different aspects of the country. So again, as you can see, subtle but I think very important differences. They're all highlighting a different theme or they have a different focus. Um, and again, you know, the next step from there is to you know, present these ideas to your target audience and see how they react to it. Um, don't have them react to you know, a fun, quirky way of saying these things, but like, get them to think about the idea. And once you know the idea is strong, then you can come up with very creative ways of, of you know, saying the same thing. So like, for example, Airbnb lets you live like the locals. Uh, you know, a creative way to say that if, um, I don't know, you're, you're talking about, you know, I don't know, family in, in Texas or something, you know, live like Sally and John, right? <laughs> That's kind of, you know, a creative way to say that. It, you understand what it means, but you're saying it in a different way and you're making it fun for your audience. Does that make sense? Are you? Yeah. <coughs> Which is, remind Yes, so um, pros and cons are really just about getting feedback as to what works, right? You're not gonna get, is that the question, right? You're not, gonna, you're not gonna get your key message figured out on the first time around. So the best way to do it, instead of just throwing ideas against the wall, is write every single one of them down and explain you know, in simple language why it works and why it doesn't. The more that you can do that, the more that you won't go you know, in circles repeating the same thing and getting stuck in a rut. Because if you know that, all right, I like this part of the sentence because it explains this concept, but I don't like the other part because it has negative connotations or um, associates my company with something different, then you write that down and the next sentence that you write, you keep that first part and then you address the second part. And then you keep refining it and you keep making it better and better. The only way to really do that is to track it. If you guys don't track it, then this exercise becomes extremely difficult. Uh, again, I see this happening all the time. People, you know, they don't know how to explain it, but they never go through this process. And so it doesn't work for them. And they keep saying the same thing, and then, you know, it's not that exciting. When I hear about the product, I don't get jazzed up about it. You know, if, if Airbnb told me, you know, uh, we'll let you, like, stay in somebody's house, I might think, you know, well, that's weird. Right, when I tell you live like the locals, experience a city, like live and breathe new cultures, that's pretty awesome, right? That gets me excited, why? Because I care about those things. So cool, so in the interest of time, 5.55, um, why don't you guys go through this exercise, write down a couple themes and then Let's say write like three or four themes for your product and then do a couple of different variations for each statement. Again, don't try to make it perfect. You know, go kind of with your stream of consciousness and write things out that again, just try to focus on benefits, benefits, benefits. Don't focus on features. Hopefully, you know, this whole process has been very helpful to you guys. Um, I think as you think about everything you've done, it's, it's very overwhelming. <laughs> There's a lot of information, but don't worry about that. Once you have time to kind of reflect on everything, you'll see that the pieces really start to fall into place. Uh, and the fact that you've actually stayed here for four hours and gone through the exercise, you're really putting yourself at a higher level than every other startup. Because answering these questions well and thinking about it and, and figuring out the answers over time and making it better, um, this, this, um, you know, these insights will help you actually then go out and find your audience in, in places that are compelling to say the right things to attract them to the business and really build the business over time.